Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. Today I have the great pleasure to announce Rakhavendra Selvan, who is currently an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen. He has responsibilities at the Machine Learning section, the Department of Computer Science, the Keen Lab, the Department of Neuroscience and the Data Science Laboratory. He received his PhD in Medical Image Analysis also at the University of Copenhagen and his Master's Degree in Communication Engineering in 2015 at the Chalmers University in Sweden. His bachelor degree he obtained in Electronics and Communication Engineering in 2009 at the BMS Institute of Technology in India. Rakhavendra was born in Bangalore, India. His current research interests are broadly pertaining medical image analysis using quantum tensor networks, resource efficient machine learning, Bayesian machine learning, graph neural networks, approximate inference, and multi-object tracking theory. So today I have the great pleasure to announce his presentation entitled Quantum Tensor Networks for Medical Image Analysis. So Rakhav, it's a great pleasure to have you here and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. So the stage is yours. Uh, for for the uh, very kind introduction and also the opportunity uh, to virtually come and talk to uh, this uh, uh, you know crowd of your uh, students I assume uh, so uh, yeah so uh, you can uh, call me Raghav uh, in short um, and uh, yeah I think the introduction uh, was uh, basically covers everything that I wanted to say but if you are on Twitter so you can follow me at that particular handle that's all my title slide is for <laughs> um, so uh, the talk uh, today is going to be about uh, quantum tensor networks for medical image analysis so this is kind of um, converging two of my so uh, it's my core interest with uh, a recent interest that I have had with quantum tensor networks and I hope by the end of this talk uh, you will also be excited as as much as I am about this particular uh, tool. Uh, so just before that uh, you know a bit more about my current research as to what I'm doing. Um, so uh, my core uh, research area is medical image analysis. So that's where I have my PhD from. And uh, since that was in 2015. So since then, I've still continued to do more of medical image analysis uh, using broadly machine learning. And then like last year, we had some bit of work using uh, the Danish cohort of the first wave of COVID where, where we also uh, try to uh, predict the risk in terms of hospitalization and so that was like a, a multi-institutional effort, uh, but it was uh, pretty exciting to see sort of uh, my research uh, in some sense being used in like a real life uh, application that we are all still going through. Uh, so other than medical image analysis, I also, because of my affiliation with the data science lab at the University of Copenhagen, I get to collaborate with different departments and then do really exciting research, uh, I think, applied, but still very exciting. So for instance, we were trying to uh, characterize the behavior of narwhals in the Arctic uh, using uh, you know, machine learning. And then we are trying to kind of uh, look at the diversity of insects uh, you know, in Sweden uh, and then uh, uh, obtain uh, properties of, uh, so pr obtain uh, molecules, nanoparticles of a particular desired structure based on certain properties. And uh, my work at the Keen Lab, which is my other half, where I'm affiliated with the neuroscience department, we study the brain. So where we're trying to characterize the behavior of mammals and then trying to look at the neuronal circuits there. So it's, it's kind of like a very diverse, but very gratifying sort of uh, 
set of applications that I get to work with. So further, there are like a few other interests which also certainly help my research. So if you are ever in Copenhagen and then if you would like to take a tour of the trails around, so I'm into trail running, but if you're not into running, so just drop me a message and then we can go for a hike also where we can discuss some research. Um, so this, uh, with this background, here's sort of the overview of, of um, today's talk. So I think uh, there's going to be a bit of, uh, you know, background that has to be provided with these tensor networks. Uh, so I think I'm going to use the first uh, 10 to 15 minutes trying to motivate and then provide basic uh, sort of notations and then some of the framework that will be used in sort of the two sets of uh, uh, you know, applications that we're going to look at. So it's uh, tensor networks for first uh, we look at classification and then how we can extend them for segmentation. So that's sort of the overview. And say, like if there is one question that we are trying to answer with this work, that would be, uh, you know, to see how far we can push linear decision boundaries. Uh, so now with a lot of deep learning going on, most of the models are highly nonlinear, uh, but can we use sort of, you know, go back and then see how far we can push these linear decision boundaries and then can we see them work as good as say deep learning models? So, uh, so here's like a very simple intuitive example. So here is data that is in 2D and then it's like a binary classification task. Now we need to, need to figure out a decision boundary. Uh, but if you see the data is not linearly separable, uh, the simple trick, which is sort of an established one in, in sort of machine learning and statistics, is to sort of lift the data into a higher dimensional space. So instead of 2D, now if you were to perform like very simple transformations on, on these data points, then what you see here is that the two classes no longer are uh, what do you say, uh, non-linearly separable, they could be linearly separable. So now, of course, it depends on what sort of transformations you're making, uh, but with the right transformations into the higher dimensions, then, you know, non-linearly separable data perhaps ends up being linearly separable. So now this is sort of the key uh, motivation with which, you know, we are going to approach, uh, you know, quantum tensor networks. And of course this isn't, um, so what, what are the examples of sort of uh, nonlinear decision boundaries? So neural networks is, is, I mean, of course there are like quite a few, but then now that we are in the age of deep learning, et cetera. So now a lot of these neural nets, that's why the nonlinearities are important. Otherwise, if you take away all the nonlinearities and multi-layered perceptron, for instance, could be implemented as a single matrix multiplication. So it's these nonlinearities which provide the flexibility so that you can learn high dimensional, uh, uh, highly nonlinear decision boundaries in lower dimensional spaces. Now, of course, uh, doing this linear decision boundary in a higher dimensional space is not very uh, you know, new as such because the kernel methods have always been doing this. So now sub support vector machines, if you have worked with them, basically do this using like an implicit, you know, infinite dimensional feature lift where you can do the dot product and then perhaps work out a, a linear decision boundary there. So this uh, being the case, uh, what we are trying to do here is basically uh, trying to see if, uh, you know, these linear decision boundaries, because if you look at support vector machines, they haven't kind of really uh, scaled up to sort of high dimensional data. So that's where I think deep learning methods have gotten a bit more, uh, you know, uh, popular. So now with tensor networks, we're trying to see if, you know, we can try and match up and then, you know, do things uh, in a different way uh, as deep learning models, but, you know, attain uh, without any compromise on, uh, you know, performance, for instance. Okay. So that's what we're trying to do with these tensor networks. So now what, what are tensor networks basically? So now um, at a very high level, tensor networks basically are approximations of linear models in, in exponentially high dimensional spaces. And then we will get to see how this exponentially high dimensional lift is done. Um, so, so think of it as a, sort of a, the simple example that I showed, but then instead of going from 2D to 3D, you might go from 2D to like a really high dimensional space. And then you try to approximate linear decision boundaries in that particular space. 
So um, in a more formal sense, they're basically um, factorizations of higher order tensors. So now that's where the tensor network comes. So if you take like a higher order tensor, which we will you know, look at examples as to how it can be done. In a formal sense, basically, um, tensor networks are basically uh, transform uh, factorizations of these higher order tensors into lower order tensors so that we can work with them. <laughs> So now they've been used in a wide ranging applications. So primarily to uh, study quantum wave functions. And then uh, in the past, like I would say 10 to 15 years, they've also uh, become quite popular uh, for data compression because it's a, you can approximate high dimensional tensor. So you can take like very high dimensional tensor and then uh, compress it by using a factorization so that you can save on, on memory or compute. Um, so they've also been studied in the context of deep learning now. So, so to kind of uh, quantify the expressive power of neural nets and, and more recently, okay, I would say not very recent, right? It's about uh, the most, the, the seminal work on this is basically coming from around 2016, uh, the, the supervised learning with tensor networks method. I mean, just around then. So uh, uh, tensor networks have since then been tried to adapt to supervised machine learning applications. So now we get into sort of the crux of today's talk. Um, and then, you know, after the talk of, I will provide the slides, I will, I will send it out to, uh, to Andreas and hopefully, uh, you know, that can also reach you. Uh, but if not, uh, so the talk is based on these four manuscripts. So the first one uh, was a conference paper last year at Medical Imaging with Deep Learning. And then we extended that uh, to a journal edition where we went from 2D to 3D data. Uh, and then there was like a, a small tweak which we did uh, in the third paper, which kind of reduced the compute uh, you know, further. And then now most recently, so there's a conference paper at uh, uh, IPMI, which is uh, 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 an image uh, processing uh, conference uh, later next month, uh, where we will be presenting the segmentation method using uh, uh, you know, tensor networks. So, uh, and, and I will also have links to the code for all these models. So if you want to go back and then, you know, try it out, et cetera, so feel free to do it. So here's sort of like a, a quick uh, one slide introduction, right, to tensor notation, uh, because um, when you want to write about, uh, you know, high dimensional tensors, uh, you know, then after, after a three dimensional matrix, it becomes a little hard to, uh, you know, keep track of what's going on. So uh, tensor notations basically give gives you a, a very easy and succinct way of uh, you know, representing uh, high dimensional tensors. So for instance, here you have a, you know, a three dimensional uh, order three tensor, uh, which is like a three dimensional matrix. Uh, but of course you could have like multiple uh, other edges emanating from these nodes. Uh, so when you want to represent high dimensional tensors. <laughs> Um, not, not just uh, representing tensors, but then tensor operations can also be very nicely, uh, matrix operations can also be uh, you know, indicated here. For instance, if you want to take like a matrix multiplication of uh, two three-dimensional uh, you know, tensors around here, so, or, or two uh, of two matrices, which are order two tensors like X and Y here. Um, so then you know, I and J are the tensor indices and then J and K are the tensor indices of Y. Now, when you do matrix multiplication, one of the index is sort of subsumed in the operation. So the index where the operation, uh, the dimension is subsumed is the common one here. So what happens now, this is basically, if you take two order two tensors and then uh, sort of do the uh, you know, multiplication, then you get uh, an order two tensor with indices I and K. And, and in tensor notation, the indices along which the summation happens um, is usually written as um, subscript. And then the indices that are retained are written as superscripts. Now you can do the trace like that uh, so that you end up getting uh, you know, a scalar alone because if you do the trace of uh, uh, you know, this matrix multiplication, then you end up getting just a scalar. So now this is sort of like a very quick introduction uh, to the tensor notation. <laughs> Um, so what our original objective was to kind of investigate linear models in high dimensional features. 
Now, um, of course, I'm going to be focusing mostly on image analysis applications, uh, but this is, uh, you know, extended. This is primarily for one dimensional data. And then we see how we adapt this for higher dimensional uh, data. So uh, if you take any vector, so that's where the 1D uh, representation comes. And then this could be basically um, sort of, uh, you know, obtained either as originally 1D data. So you can also have, uh, uh, you know, two-dimensional data, which is perhaps flattened. Now, that's not a very smart idea, right? Like if you take two-dimensional data and then just flatten it into one long vector. But let's just assume, you know, so you have input data, which is of such kind. Now, what uh, the key idea, what we do is basically take the data and then apply for each pixel, for instance, a local feature map. So a local feature transformations. Now, if uh, you, you look at something like support vector machines or, or other kernel methods, you would do like a high dimensional feature lift right there. So you would take the data and then apply like multiple feature transformations. But here we just do a simple feature transformation. Um, but it does lift it from, say, you know, a vector uh, in n-dimensional space, where, where, or, or here, if you take each scalar, right, each pixel is a scalar, and then we apply a d-dimensional feature map on that. So what could that be? For instance, something very similar. This is uh, something very simple, which comes from physics, so where we just use the sinusoids as a feature map. So now, what does this basic transformation do? It takes every pixel, and then uh, because we have a prop, uh, you know, normalized it to be between zero and one, you apply a sine and cosine transform, and then you get a two-dimensional feature map. Now, there are like very, very many uh, you know, simple transformations that you can use uh, in tensor uh, you know, network literature, uh, which can help you lift it not only to two, but then you know, a d-dimensional feature space. Now, one thing that you might want to note here is that the norm of this uh, feature uh, local feature map is uh, unity. Now, why is this important? We will perhaps see in the next operation. So what we then do is like take these d-dimensional feature maps from of every pixel and then perform a tensor outer product. So now taking every d-dimensional feature map, we do the tensor outer product across all the n uh, feature maps that we have, local feature maps. Now, this gives us a feature map that is a global feature map, that's what, the, that's what we call it, which is in D to the power n dimensional space. Now, we will kind of sort of explore, you know, <laughs> what this means. Is it something feasible or not? But uh, in uh, theory, this is what happens. So you take a, every pixel, apply a d-dimensional local feature map, and then you perform tensor outer product and then lift it to D to the power n dimensional feature space. Now, one thing that perhaps is, uh, you know, the connection that we could make here from this unit norm is that the global feature map also has a unit norm after this transformation. If it did not, then perhaps that would have like a, you know, magnitude which would explode perhaps or, or, or uh, you know, something that you might not be able to, um, you know, assess and then uh, do the computations over. So now this ensures that the global feature map also has a sort of unit uh, norm. So uh, the... Uh, yeah, so what did this transformation basically do? We take like every input vector, which could be an image or, or any input data point, which is a, a vector of uh, one, or tensor one, order tensor one with n entries into a vector in d to the power n dimensional space. So we did this in two steps. We first took every pixel and then lifted it to d dimensional local feature map and then took the tensor outer product and then it became a vector in d to the power n dimensional space. So now this is sort of the first step. Uh, if you remember the toy example we had of taking the data from a lower dimensional space to a high dimensional. And like I said, this is a, an exponentially high dimensional space, which, um, you know, is not, imp uh, you know, tractable, but we will get to how we, you know, handle the tractability soon. So 
once we have this uh, you know data in a high dimensional space now we can think about working out its uh, uh, you know linear dot product so that we can get a classification rule so we're still looking at classification so given a data point we want to be able to say which class it belongs to and then let's look at simple uh, you know some m class classifier so then that is basically given by so here we have the joint feature map which is uh, in D to the power n dimensional space. And you take a dot product with a weight matrix. Now, this is a simple, um, you know, a dot product rule where you take two tensors of the same orders or, or depending on how we have here. Uh, so you take the dot product and then you get the resultant, uh, you know, decision rule. So this is a classic uh, linear decision model. So the thing here uh, with the weight matrix here, W, or they're not a weight matrix, uh, that's uh, the weight tensor is order n plus one. So our input is a, an order n tensor, and then order d to the power uh, uh, order n tensor. And then here we have an order n plus one tensor. So when you take the dot product, you get uh, an order one tensor out. And this basically has our class predictions for our M classes. So this is the classification rule. And if written in tensor notation, this is how it would be. So here we have um, each pixel or every data point that you have. And that is an order N plus one tensor, which is, uh, you know, we take the individual pixels and then lift it to D-dimensional feature space. And then we take the tensor outer product. So that's, it has N edges here. Whereas the weight uh, tensor has N plus one uh, here, uh, edges. And once you do the dot product, so these edges will collapse. So that's basically the summing over operation like we saw in the tensor notation slide, giving out an order one tensor, which has uh, you know, the M classification rule. So that's the, the linear decision rule. But now let's think about what uh, you know, this D to the power N dimensional space is. So even if you take like a 16 cross 16 image, which is like a really small patch, right? And then in medical image analysis, we are dealing with much higher resolution. And then we take the D equal to two, uh, uh, you know, feature map, like I showed the sinusoidal one. Then the weight matrix basically has, you know, 10 to the power 17 parameters to tune which is the same number as, uh, you know, the number of atoms in the observ observable universe. And so it's just to kind of give you, uh, you know, the, the scale to which this exponential lift has happened. Now, of course, this is not, uh, now if you're already guessing, of course, we are not doing this, uh, you know, at, at, in this space, but we will use a trick uh, to approximate this. And that's where tensor networks come and the tensor network that we are going to look at is called the matrix product state. Uh, and like I initially pointed out, it's basically a factorization of a higher order tensor into lower order tensors. Now, if you look at the tensor network literature, you also will see um, a sort of a tensor train networks. So they are the same. So they're also known as uh, the matrix product state networks are also known as the tensor train networks. So there is, of course, you're trying to approximate and then you need like uh, some controlling factor as to how you, how, how you can get a good or poor approximation. And for that, we have something called the bond dimension, which I will elaborate uh, in more detail in the next slide. So um, what basically this approximation does, like I have been saying, is we take an order N tensor here, it's basically n plus one. So we have the indices running from i to n, and then we have the output index. So order n plus one tensor. And we approximate that with the you know, lower order tensors. Now, if you see each of these a's, they have either two or three indices, meaning it's either a two-dimensional or three-dimensional matrix. So because, and, and we will see how this is done, but uh, the key idea is that you can take an order, you know, N tensor, and then you can factorize it using only order, you know, two in the edges or three tensors. Now we will see what this implication is, but like I've already pointed out here, 
So the complexity, both in the terms of the number of parameters and then the compute, goes from being exponentially dependent on n, which is the number of pixels, for instance, to a linear dependency. And then there is this beta, uh, which is the bond dimension. Uh, and that's what controls our, our approximation. And let me just quickly show you what's going on. So let's take a simple example here. And in this case, we have a, an order five tensor. All right, so this is what we are trying to approximate. So uh, in tensor notation, you see it has like five edges. Now, if we look at the previous factorization, so we have these A's, which are basically going to be the tensors which are going to approximate our order five tensor. Now at the edges, we have order two tensors, meaning you see these matrices here. Right. So, and then it has, uh, and and if you also remember, I said the indices that you sum over are subscript indices, and then the ones which remain are going to be the uh, superscript index. So now we have the four up here: three, two, five, three, and then all the bottom indices have a certain uh, uh, you know, summation. That, uh, so these are the indices where you can do the summation over. And they are all two. And this two is the bond dimension, which is what is controlling how much information basically you, know, you can go, uh, use to factorize this basic, uh, you can use to approximate this higher order tensor. Now, this bond dimension can be increased and if you go to uh, a certain specific value, which we discuss in the paper, like it is um, around n over two, uh, if, if you're approximating an order five tensor, then if the bond dimension is order n by two, around uh, n by two, then you can actually get an exact you know, approximation. But that's not what we are interested in. I mean, here it's still doable, but when you're dealing with an order n where n is, you know, really high, this approximation has to be done with a small beta value, yes. beta meaning the bond dimension. Okay, so what does this do to the number of parameters? So if you take the order five tensor with these dimensions, it has 360 parameters. You can basically later go and then check. And this approximation that we have done only can in theory capture as much information because it's an approximation. Of course, we are going to lose some information with only 54 parameters. Now, this seems like um, a nice uh, way of doing it, but how much information and how do we dis how do we quantify this? Uh, of how much information can be uh, you know retained? So there's. Uh, not like an information theoretical point of view, but then there's a bit of studies done uh, in quantum uh, physics and tensor network literature there, where basically it's about how much interaction do we allow, you know, across uh, the different pixels or across different atoms. The, so that's, that's captured in this uh, approximation quality uh, figure where uh, if you have like a many body Hilbert space, uh, like the one that we have created now uh, by lifting the data to uh, an n-dimensional uh, feature space. So then um, most of the interaction happens in, not in this entire space, but basically in, uh, in, in, in the quantum literature, it is entanglement. That's what we're talking about. But from an image processing point of view, this is basically how much information, uh, what is sort of the neighborhood of, a, of a, a pixel, how much information that does it get from its neighbors, et cetera. So you can control this space, uh, you know, using the bond dimension, but it is shown that, you know, around, you know, this 1D area law. It is a, a, a theoretical law where they, uh, you can prove that most of the useful interaction happens around here. So, you know, if we needn't be in this uh, D to the power N dimensional space, but we can work, uh, get away with just, uh, you know, operating between, you know, 10 or 100 or 1000 as the bond dimension. And then we will see, we need not even go up to that, those high numbers. So, what have we now uh, looked at basically uh, using matrix product state to approximate 
or higher order tensors. And then there's the single approximating uh, uh, sort of factor that is the bond dimension. And with your reasonably small bond dimension, we can still get, make very good approximations. This sounds uh, really good. And let's see how we apply this to image analysis, right? So, okay, before that, uh, let's also just see how this, um, you know, this is just like an implementation uh, you know, strategy about how you can do very quick implementations. So the way you, this is uh, the MPS um, uh, or, or this is the dot product rule without the MPS. And this is the dot product rule with the MPS because we've taken the order N plus one tensor and then decompose that into a train of, you know, uh, order three or order two tensors. And the beta is the bond dimension along which the summation, the approximations are going on. One way to implement this would be, uh, you know, you do these contractions along these horizontal edges first, then you end up with something like this. And then you can go from both uh, the edges, uh, both the uh, ends, and then do the vertical edges. And then uh, this computation can be accelerated on GPUs, etc. cetera. Um, so this compute complexity, again, like I've been saying, from being uh, exponential in N, it becomes linear in N. So this is just one implementation, but of course there are like several ways of uh, doing this. Okay, now we get to um, um, looking at uh, the medical image classification. So what is our, uh, you know, sort of the problem of using MPS? So it is clearly defined only for one dimensional data and medical image classifications are, uh, you know, so most of the images are, are, are basically 2D, at least 2D, right? And um, in, in some supervised learning examples, we've seen that uh, it is used uh, where 2D images are taken and then flattened. And that's not, um, or, or that's what we argue that it's not a very good idea to do that. Uh, and there's no work on 3D data. So the, the, why, the main critique that we have is basically if you take like a high dimensional 2D image and then flatten it to, into one vector, so we lose a lot of local structure. And when you're interested in sort of medical image analysis or, or other image related tasks, there's a lot of information in local neighborhood. And then that is sort of lost when you just uh, discard it, uh, when you just flatten the data. So uh, in, in our uh, you know, application of MPS uh, adaptation, what we do is basically we take small regions, image patches, and then flatten them locally. And this can be sort of tied to, uh, you know, sort of classical uh, image analysis techniques like uh, assuming, you know, small neighbors, neighborhoods to be locally orderless, uh, et cetera. Uh, so, and then we apply uh, MPS onto these small patches. And then we also do the image pyramid technique. That is, you know, look at the uh, image at multiple resolutions. So we combine these in our model, which results in our locally orderless tensor network. So now, uh, as I explained, so we partition an image into small patches, and then we do something called a squeeze operation, which basically takes the neighborhood of every uh, of a pixel, and then moves it into the feature feature dimension, and then we perform the MPS at these patch levels. And um, once we have done that. Um, we aggregate the information and then move on to the next resolution. So it's sort of like in if you uh, in, in deep learning, you, you kind of do the pooling and then you can apply another convolution layer. So that's sort of uh, similar here. And, and the final output layer uh, outputs the uh, decision boundary. So what's the squeeze layer? So assuming we have like this, uh, you know, four by four image, and then what we partition it into in these two by two patches. And the key idea is basically, like I said, you move the neighborhood into the feature dimension. If you see for this particular pixel, two, five, six, and then you know we just end up with uh, the information along the feature dimension. So, and this is the squeeze the nomenclature comes from uh, other methods like in normalizing flows where uh, also neighborhoods are squeezed so that you get like an inflated feature map. So um, once we have taken the image and uh, you know, squeezed these neighborhoods into the feature dimension, now it's ready to be plugged into an MPS. So now we can make a prediction uh, uh, you know, using the uh, uh, MPS contractions so that we can output uh, like a decision boundary. Uh, and like I, uh, the other thing that we do is basically take the image and then do it at multiple resolutions, right? 
So we take the input image, we patch them up, and then we squeeze, and each patch gets its own MPS. Okay, so each patch gets its own MPS, and then we aggregate, and then it's sort of like we use the MPS here to pool or, or learn a representation of the patch, and that is again, uh, that would yield us like a lower resolution uh, image. And we do this squeeze again, and this is done iteratively, uh, in, or, or uh, you know, in, in not iteratively, but then in multiple layers. So the weights that we saw of the MPS, they can be optimized using backpropagation. So if you have the input image and then you have the label, and then all the weights can be trained using uh, automatic differentiation. So any of your uh, deep learning frameworks can be used for this purpose. Now, of course, if you don't, uh, one of the modifications that we kind of later uh, did was instead of having uh, an MPS for each patch, we can also share the MPS across all the patches. Now, this uh, we showed that it does not degrade the performance, uh, uh, you know, as much, but um, we get like an improved, uh, uh, you know, uh, compute performance in terms of number of parameters that we have to use and uh, the runtime, etc. So let's quickly get on to the evaluation. So we show the performance on, on three data sets, two 2D data sets, and then one 3D data set for classification, uh, primarily uh, binary, but of course these can be uh, extended to uh, multi-class classification. So now uh, this is um, um, a histopathology data set. Um, and then we have a CT, uh, data set for lung nodule uh, classification or presence or absence of nodules. And then we have a skull stripped um, a, a, you know, brain imaging data uh, for uh, classification in, in you know, Alzheimer's or, or not. So, and, and we compare uh, the method with uh, sort of state of the art uh, deep learning methods for each of uh, uh, you know, these data sets. So the uh, state of the art for the his patch uh, histopathology data set is the rotation equivariant CNN. Uh, and then we are reporting the area under the curve because it's a classification task. So then the trade-off between, you know, uh, the false positive rate and the true positive rate. And this is the state of the art uh, number that we have now. And then we also compared with the uh, dense net, which is a CNN based model. And ours is at, so it's it's not you know beating the state of the art, but I think it was more to demonstrate that a linear model could kind of you know go uh, and and solve some of these tasks at least. Um, of course, on on another data set, we do show that you know we can do better than the baselines that we compare with. But uh, if you notice the other column that I haven't sort of emphasized on is. Uh, actually the GPU uh, memory consumption. So now that most of these models are trained on GPUs um, and this is sort of resource intensive process. And it turns out that um, this wasn't something that we were striving towards, but uh, sort of like a consequence of how tensor networks operate is that they don't use any intermediate feature maps. So we have like very low memory footprint. Actually, the model here was parallelly trained on four GPUs. Um, later, I spoke to the authors. And then, so meaning, you know, instead of using 48 gigabytes of GPU memory, so you can use like an old four gigabyte GPU, um, and then you can still uh, get reasonable performance. And this can be sort of uh, appealing depending on, of course, now we assume that everybody has access to, uh, you know, GPUs and uh, uh, high-end machines, but it's not all, always the case and, and never, not at all the case when we look at it from a global point of view. So this could be an interesting um, sort of uh, use of these tensor networks. And, and again, so it's not at, we're not compromising too much on performance, which I think is also emphasized it in the 3D data set. So where we are able to do quite well, um, and, and again, uh, very nominal uh, memory consumption. So here I will point out that, of course, the runtime, you know, is, is not as fast as uh, uh, this is the training, uh, you know, time per epoch when compared to these baseline models. 
Um, and that's simply because uh, CNNs and MLPs have comp uh, these libraries such as PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow, which have been highly optimized for that. For tensor networks to do the MPS operation, there aren't many, but there's a lot of research going on in that direction to accelerate uh, uh, you know, MPS contractions. Um, so in summary, for the classification task, uh, so we've shown that lifting data is high, uh, to high dimensional space is useful. And, and tensor networks uh, can be used to approximate uh, these high dimensional operations in a very efficient manner. And then here we've looked at it from an image analysis point of view, but I would encourage you to look at the literature where there's more very interesting applications of tensor networks uh, for, for doing this uh, you know, approximate in, uh, approximation here. Uh, so our proposed model for 2D and three-dimensional medical image classification, the locally orderless uh, tensor network um, shows competitive performance and has some inadvertent um, you know, memory uh, advantages. Now, if you can, another way of thinking about this, if you are aware of multi-layered perceptrons, uh, they also are very similar to, or not similar, uh, but again, you have the, uh, you take the 2D data or high dimensional data for an MLP, you would flatten it and then push it through a linear layer and then you have a nonlinear activation. So if, uh, if you were to look at it analogously, then, you know, our tensor net basically has these. So the, instead of the linear layer, we have the MPS layer, which and which also subsumes this nonlinear activation because we lift the data in a high dimensional space and then do the linear operation there. So this is sort of, if you wanna see some parallels. So yeah, we've looked at classification, but then what about image segmentation? And, and for me, that's something um, I'm very keen on because that's what uh, I do mostly. I'm, I'm looking at image segmentation tasks uh, for medical image applications. Um, so we, we have some underlying issues of extending tensor networks. Firstly, as we saw, the dot product rule is basically, you know, you can go from um, like uh, the data space to a label space. And that's where dot products are most widely used. So meaning you can go from uh, like we had, so from the image space, which is say some uh, 16 by 16 or H times W space to the label space, meaning is it, you know, zero class zero, class one or class M, uh, but not, you don't get an image to image output. Um, yeah, of course, and segmentation is harder, uh, again, when we take uh, small patches and then flatten it and things like that. So how do we use uh, tensor networks? I mean, uh, that was, again, what, what we were trying to investigate, if these linear dot product models can be used to perform segmentation. Um, and the, the strategy we came up with was to, instead of looking at segmentation as like a um, uh, from an anatomical or, or a structure point of view, we can treat that as uh, taking, looking at, uh, at a neighborhood and then making predictions for uh, at, at a pixel level. So basically it's a pixel wise classification, uh, but not with only the input as the pixel, but then like a small neighborhood. So you look at the neighborhood and then make a decision on what this particular pixel could be, if it's foreground class or background class. And if you've also explored uh, uh, some more recent models like uh, transformers where they use self-attention, there's some bit of uh, you know similarity there. So even in transformers, you look at the neighborhood and then you try to uh, make prediction on uh, you know individual pixels. So uh, that, that could be some interesting analysis which uh, you know might be able to connect these two classes of models. Uh, yeah, like with uh, uh, in the classification model, we also again don't take the entire image, but then we again look at patches. Um, this is also what uh, transformer models do, for instance. Um, and we do the weight sharing. So basically we take the image and then split it into patches and then we apply the MPS, the same MPS across the image. So it's like doing your convolutional filter taking a CNN kernel and then, you know, running it around the image data. So it's sort of similar, but then here we do it in non-overlapping patches. So given any, uh, you know, uh, uh, two-dimensional image with the C channels, now classific uh, segmentation can be posed as uh, a binary segmentation or, or a multi-class segmentation task is basically learning this mapping 
from the input to the output, and then the output is in the emit space, which is h times w. Now, in as I said, in, in our segmentation model, we don't apply it on the entire image, but instead we look at a small patch, which is k times k, and then we stride the tensor network across these patches. So once you have like this k times k patch, then if you look at this, this is the decision boundary that we had uh, for the linear classification model. And the only difference being the M is no longer, uh, you know, one or, you know, the number of classes, but it's the number of pixels in the K times K patch. So now that has, um, so you take an input a vector of say, you know, 16 by 16, and then the weight matrix is uh, figured uh, is in such a way that your output is also going to be a 16 by 16. But then here it's a long vector, and then we can reshape it back into the image space. Okay, so um, yeah, well, what do we do here in terms of the implementation? Like I said, we take uh, an MPS and then it is uh, strided. Uh, uh, that's where the name strided tensor networks comes in, meaning we take um, uh, the kernel, uh, the MPS, and then we look at a particular patch and then we move it without with a non-overlapping stride. And again, so we have the input and then the prediction, and then this model can be you know, trained using backpropagation. For implementation purpose, what you can do and what we do is basically take the image and then make a batch of K times K patches, and then you can just do one MPS operation instead of doing the stride, um, which uh, improves our uh, compute uh, performance there. So uh, we look at two data sets. One is um, uh, sort of uh, cell segmentation, again, from histopathology data, and then uh, lung masks from chest x-rays. Um, so, yeah, and then like the, these input images are 1000 by 1000 pixels, and then these are scaled down uh, from uh, 256, I think, to 128 by 128, uh, because the lung masks uh, are okay if you have it in uh, sort of a really coarse resolution. Um, yeah, so I think you might have um, come across uh, the UNET segmentation network. That's sort of like our baseline segmentation model. And then we compare uh, again, the, the precision recall AUC here, and then the dice score. And then in terms of dice, we are pretty much comparable. And then UNET does slightly better in terms of uh, the precision recall here. Basically we tune um, the probabilities for every pixel uh, and perhaps a unit is better calibrated, but we haven't like done a systematic study on that. Um, so again, uh, we have uh, the number of parameters, for instance, that could be like one other way of thinking about, uh, you know, how complex a model is and then how are we trying to um, uh, say what, what is the complexity of this particular model. And then we are sort of two orders of magnitude less. But again, it, it's not necessarily uh, something that we are again comparing to say that, okay, it's a lower complexity model, but it's sort of this sufficient, this was sufficient to attain like a similar performance. And um, on the long data set, yeah. So this again, the unit does slightly better, uh, but we have slightly other advantages in terms of, again, the number of parameters and, and also in the GPU memory, but then we, we're not like really emphasizing that also here. So let's look at like qualitative examples because uh, it's an interesting, uh, uh, you know, idea, right? So for instance, if you take just an MPS, so this is what you would do, right? Like take a, a two dimensional image and then flatten it into a 1D vector and then push it through an MPS. That's what this model is. And we see that, you know, it basically learns something like an average segmentation because there's no notion of neighborhood and that's lost. And that's also similar to what you do in an MLP. So we use a multi-layered perceptron, which also flattens the image. It's that slightly better than an MPS tensor network, but it's not, uh, you know, so both suffer from the same problem that loss of structure uh, affects the segmentation performance. And, and UNET does quite well. So these are two ex examples showing the best and the sort of the worst case for the Strider tensor net. So the corresponding models here. Um, so here for the Strider tensor net, where we take the patches and then, you know, do the MPS across. 
So we see that this between the two tensor net models, the here and here, we already see our model is able to capture more structure. And this comes from, I think, the, the we're looking at small neighborhoods and then that, uh, that certainly helps. Um, yeah, and of course the models, uh, both the models make mistakes and then uh, they aren't necessarily striving to attain like the best accuracy because I think with a bit more refinement, of course you can get. So one other thing is uh, the tensor net models have only sort of uh, one hyperparameter that's the bond dimension. And then now the strided tensor network has the patch size. So these are the only two parameters. Whereas for a unit, you can tune how deep you want the model to be and then the number of feature maps and then how many uh, you know, convolutional kernels you want at every resolution. So we, we, this is basically the unit from the original paper. And then here we, we tune these two parameters to see what gives us the best performance. So, uh, in, in summary, um, a very sort of a simple idea of uh, using these MPSs on small patches gives us a reasonable segmentation. Uh, and then we do the weight sharing of MPS uh, where, where we use it on non-overlapping patches. Uh, the performance is relatively comparable. And, and here's uh, an interesting, I think, visualization where you, know, you start out with, so here, uh, if you see, this is basically the stride size. Uh, yeah, if you can see here, and then at epoch zero, and then we see how the model, you know, trains going from this blocky uh, structure to trying to figure out this is not converged to the model trains further longer, but then you see very quickly within a couple of iterations, it figures out uh, how to do the decision rule. And one perhaps question or, or one thing that we were pondering about is like, because it's just a single MPS operating on all these patches. So are we basically learning a single filter, which basically operates in a really high dimensional space because that's what is happening in some sense, right? So we take the same filter and then apply it across the image and then we get reasonable segmentation results. So that's, that's a, also an interesting thing. So overall, um, yeah, we've um, kind of explored using quantum tensor networks for uh, supervised medical image analysis. These are basically linear models in very high dimensional spaces. And like I already pointed out, it has a single model hyperparameter. That's the bond dimension, which is also very important. Um, and for the strider tensor net, there are the, the, the patch size and then the bond dimension. Yeah, we, we've seen this uh, sort of reduced GPU utilization, which is not what we're striving for, but it turns out that you can use these models also to compress neural nets and things like that. So maybe there's something to gain there. Yeah, in terms of, so this, one of the things that we noticed was that these models were, they could very easily overfit even to like really large data sets. And I think it stems from the second point that we have. That is uh, because the bond dimension is uh, the only parameter that gives you the control over how good the approximation should be. At lower bond dimensions, the model is underfitting because it takes an exponential jump in, in how many parameters the model takes. And then there's like a certain point where the model is overfitting. So that's, you know, you can't sort of uh, find the sweet spot where your model is, is, is just optimal. But there are other ways of uh, overcoming that. But it's just like if you were to just directly plug this on your data, you might see that it's either underfitting or overfitting. So then you need to do a slight bit more uh, tuning of uh, some of the other parameters, perhaps, um, or, or, or some of the other strategies like you know augmentation and uh, stuff like that. In terms of implementation, it's not optimized for efficiency, uh, like I said. So it's not the TensorFlow or uh, uh, PyTorch uh, efficient, but there are like some libraries which I will point out later. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the question of can linear models be as powerful as neural nets? Uh, I think with this work, the, the two segments, classification and segmentation work, I think we can say that yes, uh, to a large extent. Uh, and and uh, of course they're not uh, studied as much as uh, neural nets have been. 
uh, but there is a lot of room for improvement. And I think we would like to explore this a bit more and we encourage uh, uh, you know, the community also to take a look at this. And it's an interesting sort of a synergy between quantum physics and then the physics uh, crowd and then machine learning. There's a lot of ideas that are being exchanged, uh, which is, I think, very good. It's always when two communities end up uh, together, perhaps newer insights can be found for both the communities, which I think is amazing. Yeah, it's slightly different from the way we think about uh, feed forward neural nets and convolutional neural nets, but I think that's also, but it's a very simple one. It's just a linear model in a high dimensional space. Yeah, there are actually formal connections to Gaussian processes. Um, uh, I think I point to some of those in, in, in the literature very recently, but, but I think it's still waiting a bit more formal assessment, I would say. Yeah, uh, so if you want to try it out, there's a PyTorch implementation for MPS, and then there's one on Julia, which is maintained uh, uh, by uh, some really good uh, groups. And then there's also the, the, the one on TensorFlow, and then some more recent ones on JAX, uh, which is the NumPy auto differentiation package. All right, so I think that's uh, basically my talk. I would like to thank my collaborators and then the code is available at this link. Uh, but if you also go on my profile, there's the Strider TensorNet um, model uh, that's also available out there. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to write to me. And uh, yeah, before uh, we answer questions, I also want to plug a tool uh, that uh, we put out last year. It's called Carbon Tracker. Um, which is uh, basically to try and uh, track and quantify the carbon footprint of training deep learning models. And this is also one of the, the low resource machine learning that I'm interested in. Uh, so I encourage you to try it out and then see. Uh, so if the model, uh, once you use carbon tracker, it'll predict in terms of how much, uh, for instance, if you were to drive a car, uh, what is the distance you're driving for training a particular model? And then some of the models that we We've looked at it's like the most um, you, either you go like 300 kilometers and then we did this for the most complicated model uh, out there for deep learning and then that's like you can go around the earth once so it's uh, quite fascinating out there all right so yes i'm open to questions now thank you very much for the presentation and i do have some applause for you uh, <laughs> I hope you can hear that. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, in the virtual space, it's difficult to clap. <laughs> we, we have some knocking on the table recorded here for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I could hear that. Thank you. Thank you. This was a very inspiring presentation. And I must say, I, I really enjoyed it. And I also like the, the notation for the tensors that you introduced. So that's, that's pretty cool. And uh, you can um very quickly then follow w what is actually being computed so that's that's actually very nice um in in this notation do you actually still need a transpose or something like that or is that immediately clear by connecting the right parts and writing the dim dimension um yeah, it's, a, it's again just a flow of the edges kind of takes care of of, yeah. uh, of the transpose you would just swap the indices uh, and also the index uh notations like for instance if you write the i's and then the j's so you can yeah you need to sort of keep track of which index you're trying to say sum over and and that uh, takes it into account i would say so which index goes where it's um yeah uh, in the transpose you mean yeah no, no but i was also wondering if there is if you i mean for two or three dimensions uh, it's very easy with the connections but if you have really like five or more um then you essentially just blow it up and you have multiple connections to the same uh, uh, entity, right? Yes. So, so, so it, it is. Um, yeah. So I think for the transpose itself, right? So you have, um, I think uh, you can treat that as uh, another transformation operation where you just have the edges going uh, back into another tensor, which take a different uh, I see. formulation. I see. Uh, but but I think this this is very uh, simple sort of examples that I have given. But I think there there's extensive uh, uh, developments on the tensor notations. But it's it sort of originally stems from uh, Roger Penrose in in, mm -hmm. uh, in his work from 1971. But it has matured quite a bit, where uh, very advanced, uh, sophisticated applications can be done with with the tensor notations. Yeah. 
That's that's pretty cool. Um, regarding the feature transforms in the experiments you showed, uh, is there a standard set that you're using? Are you using sines and cosines or? Um... Uh, yes, the standard set would be sines and cosines, uh, which uh, you know end up uh, giving unit norm for for instance. That's the. Yeah, so we we can just put the the reference to the paper. And yes. then people can look it up just that they know what what kind of transforms. Yeah. And you also have the requirement that the inputs are, are scaled from from zero to one, right? Yeah. So, but that's something we would do uh, also in deep learning models uh, right. where uh, we would just normalize it, uh, and that's what we encourage here. Yeah, but, but otherwise the the waveform of the sine and cosine will will get exactly. you into trouble, right? Yeah. Um, so that's cool. Are there also learnable um, feature transforms? Uh, yes, actually, um, in, in our case, we wanted to keep this sort of uh, very uh, basic. So we just took the you know sinusoidal ones. But uh, there have been studies where these transforms were neural nets by themselves, like an MLP, hmm. where you learn those transforms. And I think th they have also shown to be a sort of, you get like a slight advantage because you can then learn a bit more expressive task specific feature map. Uh, but I think the somehow the elegance of these non-learnable feature maps is also saying that, hey, okay, take this and then plug it on, you know, multiple data sets so you don't have to retrain. Uh, uh, so that was our motivation for just uh, sticking to um, just non-learnable. But yes, so you could use something like, uh, um, uh, like an MLP, for instance, that would be just a very expressive one. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, technically probably also gives you an advantage in the implementation if you if you can use a, a fixed set um, yeah. in yeah. terms of execution speed and so on. Exactly. Uh, so that's that's the other. Uh, okay. Um, there's 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 more questions yes. here. Um, uh, one thing that. Um, some people were wondering is the receptive field uh, if you use the the patch based processing and then the receptive field at the border pixels it could be quite different would it make sense to use something like a, a strided um, uh, mps with overlapping patches so I think for the segmentation is where we sort of very clearly saw uh, uh, what happens there. Uh, for instance, let me just go back to the... Um, yeah, so the last picture that I had, yeah, here. So uh, w one of the things that we were also expecting was that we would have issues when we had the non-overlapping patches. So basically because of the receptive field from the edge to the center and the different regions, it would be very different. Um, but it uh, turns out uh, this wasn't uh, an issue because uh, one of the things with like a convolutional filter is that the, the signal coming from the border pixels is slightly different than when you are in the center of the uh, of the image, for instance, because there's the same amount of information in the middle pixels, but then you lose some on the edges. But here, when we take these MPS patches and then flatten them, so every patch has sort of the same receptive field. So the edge pixels or the, the one in the bulk of the image, mm -hmm. both have like very similar sort of a, yeah, basically the, the receptive field is very similar. And um, we did, of course, think about trying to do the overlapping patches uh, the, with the strides that can be overlapping. But because we did not see any severe consequences of uh, these non-overlapping patches, we still uh, just tried to retain it without. Uh, so of course, another interesting experiment would be to try it with an overlapping patch. But I think that would be just for like so, sort of systematically quantifying if there is any loss of information when, when you do the non-overlapping patches to the overlapping patches. So I think we also did not do that simply because like I showed in the implementation, it was a, an easy trick for us to just do this, you know, batching of the patches and then run it once through the MPS. Yeah. And that also gave us a performance edge, I would say. Uh, but we, we are actually uh, also, um, I, I, I think there is no 
edge effects simply because the way how CNN kernel works to an MPS block works. That would be sort of my conclusion on that. Mm -hmm. And all of these results are with shared weights for the for the yes. prices, right? Yes. And, so, and that's where we speculate that uh, we're learning like a single filter maybe. So. Yeah. Because that's also the key for arbitrary input sizes, right? If you if you don't have shared weights, then if you have a varying number of patches, or do do you have to scale everything uh, into into a fixed input grid, or could you also work with different um, number of patches? Um, yeah. So in this case, uh, we just uh, it is tried on uh, on a fixed input grid so but then the thing would be uh, the only fixed variable here is the number of the, the length of the vector that goes into the mps so now you could have like a varying size input but if the patch size is the same i think that's the only sort of the fixed weight the weight is tied to only the number of uh, you know pixels within that patch but of course you could construct like uh, an irregular grid of the same patch size for instance and it would still work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but that would then technically also mean that you could also develop something like mps feature maps right that you that you have uh, multiple sets of shared weights that are being used and then you run them in parallel and you could then use them as new inputs to a new layer? Yeah, so uh, something like a, uh, like a kernel bank uh, yes. in the CNN, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, yes, I think that could be uh, exp uh, you know certainly done because this is something we, we touch upon in the classification model, but for the segmentation, um, so again, what we were trying to push was for to see if we can just use a single MPS and then mm -hmm. learn, but it's sort of like a relatively yeah straightforward sort of an implementation sort of like from taking a cnn approach saying like let's make a bank of mps features and then cascade you know them into multiple layers and then try to uh, do a segmentation network out of that uh, yeah i think that's something we may explore in the in the in the future yeah hmm. but i i don't immediately sort of because um if because CNN, somehow my intuition is also that uh, you can learn different types of, uh, you know, kernels, which kind of pick up on different signals. Of course, an MPS could also do that. Um, but if a single kernel can do it, if, if we were able to solve segmentation with a single kernel, with a CNN kernel, would we still be using multiple banks of uh, features? Uh, is, is Yeah. No, I, f I think it rather opens a kind of a continuum for yes. for the optimal configuration. And with the MPS, you have an additional parameter or, or building block that yeah. you can use in the deep network. So that um, um, just what you've shown, it's extremely powerful and showing that you can do it with a single block with uh, shared weights is very impressive. And it's, so in, in several implementations or in several problems, you have beat the state of the art in others, you were very close. And I was wondering whether you can bridge that yeah. little bit of performance gap with methods right. like this one. Uh, I, I would guess so. Uh, um, yeah, we, we did not sort of uh, try that out. But yeah, like you said, it opens up like another uh, sort of uh, a space where we could have deeper networks or multiple banks of uh, MPS and we try to aggregate the features from there. Yeah. And and did you think of certain configurations of MPS where they then would collapse essentially to a convolution kernel or, or a similar concept? So I think the closest um, idea is to think of MPSs as the strided convolutional kernels. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, but, but I think from there again, uh, that the difference then would be perhaps the the nonlinearities again mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. and without that then this uh, so like we had this analogy with the multi-layered perceptron to uh, an mps so that's still sort of our, our intuition now in this case in the segmentation task we're still thinking this to be something like a, a single kernel that is basically able to uh, you know segment all of it but we haven't done like a formal sort of a study on, uh, say, converging, like when does an MPS become a CNN kernel or, or vice versa? So yeah, it, it would probably be like um, 
collapse solutions, right? Where, where you have to choose an internal dimension of one and, and yeah. many more tricks that you're using have to be identity and, you know, yeah. Yeah. That in order to, to make it fit such a simple operation. Because after all, convolutions are pretty simple, right? Yes. Um, so, but that would... Um, it's it's interesting to think about the, how how you configure the MPS such that the simple operation falls out, um, because you on multiple um, instances yes. did the comparison between a, a C and N kernel and the MPS. Yeah, because so. it's, it's a, like a C and N operation at every level is sort of like a, an element twice multiplication, yeah. and yeah. that is easily approximated with an MPS. Yes, so. exactly. So you, you probably need identity for the, for yeah. the lifting and then yeah. the internal dimension of one and uh, so, so mm. all park. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, but it should it shouldn't be that hard to show it. No, um, no. And yeah. and then the the intuition that you have a structure that can do many more operations um, is is very easy to follow. Um, so that's pretty cool. So, and obviously you can also combine this with like a, a CNN filter CNN. block in the first layer and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. So like I said, there's a bit of work done on using like a neural net based feature map extend uh, and then training the MPS end to end. But I haven't seen work where the MPS is used to sort of do the feature extraction. But tensor networks have been used to um, do sort of dimensional to reduction of input data. So that's something they have been very prominently used. So the supervised learning is the newer one. So I think going from there, then one can also use MPS as like a, a dimensionality reduction method of your data set and then plug it into your or neural net. And, and awesome. then that would be also another application. I see. Cool. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. It was full no of new insights. And yeah. I, I really you. appreciated your talk. And I'm very glad to be here and give this presentation. So thank you very much. No problem. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and just feel free to write to me uh, if you have any uh, questions. I will send out the slides uh, so that you have access to the paper and the repositories. So. Excellent. So. I hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. There was a very long and very nice discussion. And I must admit that I learned one or two things in this presentation. So if you like the presentation, then get in contact with us so the discussion doesn't have to end here. So we can really answer your questions in social media. I will also put the links to the documentation, to the source code, to the papers, and also how to contact Raghav here in the description of this video. So I hope you also enjoyed the video. If you liked it, then you can also subscribe to this channel. There will be more presentations like this coming up in the next episodes of Beyond the Patterns. <laughs>